So hello, everybody. Um, I think almost everybody in this room has seen Witness Uganda, the musical production that has been drawing a lot of rave reviews. And I want you all to join me in welcoming the co-creators, Matt Gould and Griffin Matthews. <laughs> and for, I guess, a few of us who have not seen that, the show yet, um, it's this beautiful story, a very human story, about a young man who arose from New York and travels halfway across the globe to change the world. He gets to Uganda. However, instead of changing the world, he finds himself on this journey that changes his life forever. And tell me I got that right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And what I guess most people know right now is that it's based on a true story. It's based on your story. And um, as I walked out of the theater, I, I saw it on Thursday, uh, the words I heard used to describe the production was, were amazing, engaging, phenomenal. Why do you think this production resonates so much with people? And as it was being crafted over the years, what did you hope people were going to walk away with? You know, the production was um, originally a benefit concert. So we uh, really stumbled into writing a musical. We never intended for it to be a musical with, you know, years of development. It started as a benefit concert. I think you should probably tell the story of even how the benefit concert started, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it was 2008, the US economy tanked, uh, and we had 10 students in, in school, uh, several of which were about to start university. And so our annual budget was $25,000 a year. It was going to double to $50,000 a year, because we had students starting university. And uh, our donors were drying up, because uh, Nobody had money. And uh, I said to Griff, you know, why don't we write a, a short musical infomercial uh, as a benefit to help raise money for the kids. We'll get our Broadway friends together. It'll be a concert. We'll make a fortune. It'll be amazing. And Griffin was like, that's the worst idea I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, there was something about the way that Griffin speaks, uh, and the, specifically the way he was speaking about uh, the complexity of trying to help people that I felt really felt true to this time in America and uh, Americans sort of, I think, obsession with trying to figure out what is our responsibility to each other, what is our responsibility in the world, what is our responsibility as a global citizen. And so I started recording his rant. Secretly. Secretly. <laughs> secretly. <laughs> and uh, at, at night, I would also secretly start weaving music through the recordings and uh, eventually played them back for Griff. And something just felt right about it. Sort of that instinct that, that I was sort of thinking of, it just it felt right to both of us. And we started to, to develop it. And uh, you know, we did that benefit concert. And after renting the theater and paying the lighting guy, we made no money. <laughs> but, uh, but people came up to us. Even it, was a, even it was a mess. The first 30 minutes was a mess. It was like five songs, weird stories in between. But even then, people seemed to be interested in it. They would come up to us afterwards and go, that's my story. I did you know, Teach for America, and I don't know if I did any good. Or I went and built a school in Guatemala, and there was a mudslide, and the school fell down. And what was the point? And uh, I, I think it just is about something that a, a lot of Americans are trying to, are, are grappling with. And even more than aid work, uh, I think as Americans, we are we love the idea of things that are polished and clean and neat and perfect and big and beautiful. And that may be fine for the surface, but I think deep down we all know that life is actually messy and jagged and complicated and relationships are hard and life is messy. And I think that that's something that we don't like to talk about as a culture a lot of times. And I think I think that that is what is resonating with people, I think, and I hope. And I think also certainly as a nonprofit, you know, when we, as a nonprofit, you got in a project, which is the name of our organization, you're, you're supposed to get up and tell people how amazing it is. And oh my God, when you see the kids, you're going to think how amazing the work is. And what we thought would be an interesting take on it is if we told people how hard it was. And that sometimes we're not sure if we're actually doing 
more good uh, than than harm. We, we just didn't know, or more harm than good, I should say. Um, but I think that people were so curious about the honesty of us telling people that there are mistakes, and um, and I think that people crave, you know, in, in the age of reality TV, they crave, you know, reality, reality. <laughs> but it's. It's amazing the way you speak about these issues because yes, indeed, the production takes on big themes. The, the, the theme of foreign aid, there's a lot of arguments for and against. And um, one dominant argument is the fact that a lot of foreign aid ends up creating a culture of dependency. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. just what's your take? And considering I know um, you've you, you worked as a, you volunteered as a Peace Corps member in West Africa and you, your trip to Uganda. What's your take on this? And how does project, uh, you, the Ugandan project weave through that as well? Sure, I think uh, there is a culture of dependency. To be completely honest, I think that, um, you know, Uganda project, we intentionally stayed small. We only have 10 students and we've kept it that way because I think the, the success of our organization is because it's small and because it's built on relationships. And so the kids are dependent on us. And I was also dependent on my parents. And I think that a healthy dose of dependency is what's needed to actually help someone. And for me, I felt like we wanted to keep Uganda Project functioning like a family. And when you're dealing with kids who have been orphans since they were 16, They've missed life lessons that their parents would have told them or that they would have, they would have had different experiences. And so we ended up sort of becoming their, their parents. And so yes, there is a culture of dependency, but also because we've allowed them to be dependent on us and we are dependent on them to make the grades and get the results, um, there's this codependency that's actually become really beautiful because then I think, like in my parents' case, because I was dependent on them, they were dependent on me, then they were able to create a culture of independence out of that. And I think that that's exactly what's happened with Uganda Project. When our kids, we've had uh, three kids graduate from the program, one of which is uh, he moved to Australia. He got a job in Australia, met an Australian woman, and married her. They had a baby. In November, we are proud gay granddaddies. Um, another one of our kids just got hired by World Vision after three years of looking in, uh, in Uganda for work. Got hired by World Vision. Um, another. Uh, our first female graduate of nursing school just graduated in August. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it took years of them being dependent on us, but then we can sort of, you know, gracefully usher them out into the real world because we actually know them and we can always say, look, if you're, if you're ever in a bind, call me. But do you, do you hope that that would um, go full circle and hopefully they could also give Back? For it's sure, happening. it's happening. It's already doing it. Yeah, yeah. we have a stu we have a student who uh, on our last trip, we took our students to this beautiful lake up in northern Uganda, and uh, we were sort of doing this hike up this hill, and and you know this one student in particular who comes from a really by American standards very rural, very rough background. And we're walking up the side of this hill through this village, and this student says to me, Matt, I have never seen poverty such as this. <laughs> These kids walking around barefoot, playing soccer, and, and playing soccer barefoot. On my vacation, I want to come back here and volunteer at this school so that I can help them the way you have helped me. And that's not something we even had to say. Now, when, you're done with, when we're done with you, you have to go and volunteer in your, in your community. It was something he chose to do by himself. Yeah. Just an interesting side note to the story is that we, when we went to this village and we were standing at this village school, the headmaster of the school came up to us, Griffin and I, the Muzungus, and, and he was like, oh, you know, let me show you the school, let me, you know, just hoping that we were going to do something, not realizing that there we were standing with five college-educated Ugandans uh, who live in Uganda, who want to volunteer, who want to help their country. Who can fix computers. Who can, fix com who can do things that we can't do. I mean... We're, we're really somewhat useless at a village school in Uganda, but our students aren't. There are things that they could actually be useful for there. Um, and I think that that's, it, it's just a matter of sort of changing that mentality. And that's not something we'll be able to do. That's something that they're going to do. 
And I think it's something that we wanted to happen organically, which is why you know some organizations say, and then after you've graduated, you have you owe us two years of your life to volunteer. And I actually don't think that's the right way to do it. Not for us. What I wanted was for that organic moment of, oh my God, I've been helped, and now I'm able to help you, and so I want to do that, as opposed to now I owe Uganda Project a year of service. We wanted them to feel like empowered enough to know that service was possible if they chose it, the way that it was possible for me if I chose it. Yeah. And I did. And so did he. Great. Um, I can remember the character Joy coming on stage. And I'm like, oh, I know you, you know? I'm like, you know, she, she gives up this effect when she sees the white people and treats them a certain way. And I've met a lot of young Americans, Europeans, who come over to Nigeria. And they come to help out. And they are being scammed a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think, and I guess I'll just speak to one of my colleagues um, a couple of minutes ago, the fact that the character Griffin perseveres and you know, overcomes the situation he finds himself in. Do you think it's, it was more about his perseverance or the fact that even at the end, he was still a little bit naive? And maybe that naivety mm -hmm. sort of? I think that you know, people always, it's been so interesting being at Harvard because it, there are people here, obviously, deep thinkers, big minds, people that study philanthropy for a living and then teach it and tell everyone how it should be done. And, um, and I also, for me, I didn't go to Harvard, um, <laughs> though I would have wanted to. <laughs> I didn't go to Harvard. I went to Carnegie Mellon University and studied musical theater for four years. And, but I still had the urge to want to help. And I think that a healthy dose of naivete is actually necessary for the work. Now, if you ask a Harvard professor, they might completely disagree with that. But I'm not a Harvard professor. So I'm going to tell you that a healthy dose of naivete is why I went and why I stayed. And I think that when I talk to young people And why we time, still stay. And why we, yeah, why we still stay. I think when we talk to young people all the time, they're like, should I do all the research? And you know, I'm thinking about going. And I don't know. I've been, you know, I've been YouTubing videos. And it's, there's so much research. And I'm like, if you over-research yourself, you'll never go anywhere. So you kind of want to go with, with, with some blinders about you know, what you think it's going to be, because that's when all of the life can actually happen. It's like dating, right? Like, I can meet you for a date, but if I've like already Facebook stalked you and already Googled you, it's like, what is there to learn? I've already created this idea of what it will be. That's the way it works to see. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you, 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 you can eliminate the room to actually experience it all. And I also say, you know, with the caveat of going with a healthy dose of, na a dose of naivete, to also not go and start telling people how to do it and what to do. To, to go and want to experience and learn and listen. And I think that those were the lessons for me to actually go and listen instead of talk, 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 talk. Because I think that when you're listening, that's when you're actually receiving. When, you're, when you go to be a student, mm. you learn how to actually be a teacher. Be a teacher. Yeah. I, I promise I'll hand over the mics to you guys soon, but I have just two more questions. Mm -hmm. Speaking about research, it's funny that you chose Uganda, <laughs> being a gay man and all the controversies. Mm -hmm. Did you have no idea before you went and mm -hmm. looking <laughs> and, <laughs> and looking forward um, in the years coming? Because I know you've mm -hmm. established something really beautiful. It's not just a charity. It's a family you've mm -hmm. created back there. With the issues there, do you have any fears of going? Back. Remember when I talked about the he healthy dose of naivete? <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know what was going on in Uganda. I had no idea. And I start, if you've seen the play, I start the play without saying, God's not going to show you the full story of your life because you wouldn't be able to handle it. Mm. And I think that I always tell people that I didn't choose Uganda. Uganda chose me. And so I don't think that it's a mistake that a person running from their sexuality in the United States landed in one of the most dangerous places in the world for gays. I think it's why we're here now. I think it's why um, 
why the show is creating a conversation about the, the, the movement and anti-gay bill going on in Uganda right now. Um, I knew enough to not go to Uganda and wave the rainbow flag. I knew that much. <laughs> but I didn't realize, and also in 2005, the anti-gay bill didn't exist. So it wasn't necessarily in the same kind of, you know, I, I wasn't totally being ignorant. I, it wasn't, there's plenty of places in the world, including in this country in 2005, where I couldn't have gone somewhere and waved my gay flag. So, so I went knowing to, to keep my life private. But as I started to learn what the situation was, I realized that I was already so deep in love with the kids that, that it was going to be something that we were going to have to navigate. Do you want to talk about the future? I mean, the future is uncertain. Because at this point, uh, right this minute, it's not safe for us to be in Uganda. Uh, quite honestly, in part because of the attention that this show has received here, which is awesome, and we're like not famous by any stretch of the imagination. But it's enough that you know two American gay men showing up at, uh, in Uganda right now who have talked a lot about the bill like in the media, uh, it, it, could, it could be very problematic for us. And, and quite honestly, for our students. And so for their safety and for ours, we will have to stay away for, for a bit. Um, but you know, I mean, it's it's a little bit of a, a maybe cheesy thing to say, but but I do believe that that love does always find a way, and I believe that family always finds a way, and uh, it's not going to force us to cease our operations there or cease help you know supporting the students. They will still receive their support, and if we have to meet with them outside of Uganda, then we'll meet with them outside of Uganda, and this will provide an opportunity for a family vacation to. Some other African country, <laughs> but uh, but it's uh, but it is a reminder also of uh, one of the it's just one of the panelists from the other night in Act Three, Sue Cook, who's the executive director of the Committee on African Studies here at Harvard. She she said, you know, there is evil in the world. There is messed up stuff, and this is a you know they're printing the names, addresses, and workplaces of homosexuals in the newspaper in Uganda. It's it's the Holocaust. I mean, I'm, I was raised Jewish. That is what I was taught about in Hebrew school for 15 years, that this is, this is what it looks like. And that's what it looks like. And it's, in many ways, it's, it's strange. Griffin said Uganda chose him. And I remember coming out of the closet as a, as a freshman at Boston University and thinking, telling my parents, you know, yes, I'm gay, but I will never be the, uh, you know, the poster child for the gay movement. Me too. Right? I told my parents that too. And, and suddenly, um, not even because of what's happening in this country, even like the gay marriage fight always seemed sort of distant to me in this country. But what's happening in Uganda, because of that, it's, I've never felt closer to what it means to be a gay man and, and the peril that people's lives are in because of who they are, and, and men and women. Um, so it's very scary and very upsetting. But uh, I, I, I am hopeful, because I'm an, an idealist, because I am maybe naive, I am hopeful that there will come a time in my life when gay people will at least be able to be open in that country and not fear for their lives. As journalists, we take words and we craft them into stories. And um, I'm sure everybody's, everybody here is particularly fascinated the way you, know, you, take, you took words and you crafted it into this beautiful thing. And we've shown our hands by the piano. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. And we wondered if just a little bit of the magic show us how that evolved. Then. Do you, do you want to do? Well, you should do. I think we should do prayer. OK. Is that cool for you? Let's do it. Do you want to do the other one? No, let's do okay, it. OK, let's do it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, let's do this. So people, when I tell people that I work in Uganda, they're always like, oh my god, are you building schools in Uganda? I'm like, no, Uganda has those buildings. Those buildings <laughs> exist, but school isn't free. People can't afford to get educated. So no, we're not trying to resurrect buildings. We're trying to resurrect people. We're, we're trying to resurrect people. We're trying to resurrect people. 
And that's a harder thing to prove than showing <laughs> bricks. 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 We always in the West assume like aid can only be tied Five to dollars. Bricks. Like you have to be giving people money and they have to be building something or whatever they're doing with bricks. money. And you have to be able to, have to be able to, you know, count it and track it and 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 count it. afternoon song. No. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that really he recorded me saying, people always are like, you know, expecting me to show them a building. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to resurrect people. That was the speech. That was the start of it. People always ask me to show them a building in Uganda. I'm like, we're not trying to build buildings. We're trying to resurrect people. And then he took it. And then that goes into, that goes into. We are. What well, we're trying to resurrect people. We're it's it sort of started there. But I think, you know, the, I I remember working on the sort of verse of this. Like it, the, for me, in my mind, music is a very sort of abstract thing. Mm -hmm. It sort of it reaches a place that is that sort of goes past your brain into your like core. So when I hear him ranting about, you know, it's, it's not about this. It's not about, like, to me, that sort of comes, goes through my body and goes to the place of, like, and that, that's really how the music starts. It's like a, me into a tape recorder going, it's that. It's, it's really just completely abstract and, and nothing. And then I'm like, OK, so what is it that, like, how, how does that how does the music then become like a more sort of reasoned, rational um, representation of like his core? And then we start looking for words, you know, like and the song at, started in Pular. The song started in Pular, which is a language that I spoke in West Africa, because that's the, that's the language I that, that was the language I knew. And the reason 
that I felt like the song needed to be written in a different language was because it, in, English for me, in, oftentimes, is too, it's too hard to write in English. It's too complicated. And when you're writing in a language that's not your first language, that's your second language, for me, I am forced to get down to the simplest, clearest idea that I can possibly get to. So when I lived in Mauritania for two years, if I had to tell somebody, you know, I'm feeling really upset right now because my boyfriend broke up with me and I just don't know what to do about it. I couldn't say all that in Pular. But what I, what I could say is, Berinderam in a Musi, my heart hurts. And that was something that they could understand. Berinderam in a Musi was something that was a lyric. It just became something clear, like right to the core. And that's what a lyric has to do. It has to get right to the heart of what it's about. You can't waste words. You can't waste time. So that was how it started. It started, you know, I, I was at, what, what I wrote was um, buildings, a brick is made of dust. A brick is made of dust, but man is made in the image of God. That was like the clearest possible way, and that, and that was something that I figured out how to say in Pular and then Luganda. We then translated the Pular to Luganda. And that became what the song was about. It felt, it felt very true to what he was, was talking about. So I don't know if that, if that helps you, because I think the art of making that is actually very abstract and messy and. But I also think that Matt, a lot, as you can see, Matt is very, <laughs> right, that's Matt. And then I was like, the song needed like. A, a hot chorus. Make me in the image of God, forgive me for all. It needed, you know a long line, you know, Matt is really good at finding all the this, and then we would say, well, we need something that need, you know, we need a break, we need a break, <laughs> you know? Um, but also about why a lot of the show is in Luganda, the music is in, in Luganda, and I think that we did that also because sometimes as Americans, especially people, theater goers, will hear English and we're already analyzing the English. We're just going, oh, I didn't like that lyric. Mm, nope, that didn't rhyme. You know, we're just <laughs> missing that like, it, when you're hearing it in another language, sometimes you're just getting the feeling and, you, and the actors get to, we get to act what the lyric is and you're just getting hit with feeling. We, we're like a big fan of uh, foreign films and sometimes like, and even in foreign cultures, when you go and travel, like you don't know what people are saying. And that's the experience of being an American in Uganda. So we wanted people to, the audience, to feel like they've been dropped into that as well. And so sometimes, you know, like we've gone to Ugandan funerals and we don't know what they're saying, but you know what they're saying as they're keening and, oh, Uganda, oh, Uganda, oh, Uganda. You know what they're saying. I don't need you to put up a, a translation on the screen. I already know what you're saying because I'm feeling your emotion. And so we, as we wrote the music, we said, you know what, this song doesn't need to be in English. Those words don't need to be translated. We want the audience to just get hit with emotion so that they can bypass that rational thought. Um, I'm curious if any of the students have seen the work, just because you obviously they're such a big part of it. And I don't know if the characters were based on seeing other people or if you combined characters. The students haven't seen the musical. Um, we actually wanted them to come to Cambridge to see the show, but they're in the middle of their semester, and so we thought it, it would be irresponsible as parents to pull them out of school. Um, so they, they haven't seen the show in its entirety, but they know that the show exists. They're really excited about it. They helped us to translate some of the songs and some of the scenes, and um, we sing the songs in Uganda when we're with them. And uh, they Skyped with the cast on the second day of rehearsal, so the cast has got a chance to actually talk to them and become Facebook friends. And <laughs> it's been really incredible to include them in the process because they don't have an idea of what Broadway is or Harvard or Diane Paulus or Tony Awards. They have no idea what any of that means. Um, but they're really excited that we're telling a story about Uganda. And as far as... Uh, I guess the second question was... Are they, are they each individual characters? Or right, characters? so, so the, all the characters in the show are <coughs> combinations of many people. We did that for several reasons. One, to create a theatrical experience, and two, to also protect identities of people that you know, are inside of the story. And it really actually was best that way to combine the characters, so that, or to combine people into a character, 
because it gave us freedom as writers to not be like, no, this really happened this way, or she really wouldn't say that. It was like the character wants to say this. And so that's how we, we created so it. So Jacob, was Jacob one a singular character in a merger? All of them were all merged. Okay. Um, my name is Robbie Nesman. I'm from the AP, and I am a foreign correspondent. I spent a lot of time in Africa. And I heard you on the radio. I heard you on the radio, man. I was shocked. Your accent is so good that I actually was shocked to find out that you were an African. But uh, in, in some ways, getting back to what you're saying to Marie, I wonder if there's complexity in doing so much in Luganda and using African music is. Is that a difficult thing for you guys as not as not Africans to do? And how do you make that kind of cross-cultural experience from here and not feel like you're appropriating or, or not doing a, you know, doing a disservice to that culture? I think that, first off, uh, we've made a very conscious decision to tell an American story. Uh, we, you know, we were two American guys. and. And I think very early on in this process, we realized, OK, we, all we can do is tell the story as we saw it. Um, the idea of, of appropriation is, is tricky to me, because it, 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 for me, it becomes a little bit about like where do you draw the line? Can a man never write a story about a woman? Can a woman never write a story about a transgendered person? I, like, I don't know. It's just, just where, does the, where does the line end? And I think that what we tried to do was certainly to be respectful of, of that culture to include Ugandans uh, in the creative process, which we've done both in Uganda and here in, with the Ugandan community in Waltham as we've, as we've built the show. Uh, and in terms of the music, um, it's so interesting because like African music, both in West Africa and in East Africa, is such, a, in the same way that American music, is such a mashup of so many different cultures. You know, Our students aren't sitting and listening to traditional Ugandan drumming. It's just not what they're listening. Our students are listening to Beyonce. <laughs> and, um, and so in working on the score, I, I think that we wanted to create something that, that at times nodded to some of, the, some of the traditions of that place, because it still does exist. We still will walk down a road in Uganda and hear a bunch of guys like banging on drums, or in some cases, like plastic made in China containers. Uh, but, um, but for the most part, you're, you're hearing like music influenced by South America and reggae. reggae. Most Ugandan music sounds like reggae. So, so yeah. it, it really was, I, I think that, that ultimately we wanted to create something that felt contemporary, that felt true to our experience, the experience that we've had with our students, and also that came through us. Um, people, people did ask at one point, you know, why don't you get, a, you know, you should team up and partner with a Ugandan musician and, like they, and let them write the music. And I was like, that's awesome. If there was a Ugandan musician that we like wanted to work with, we would do it. We absolutely would do it. But this was a story that, that we knew that we wanted to tell. And we also knew we were writing this story, at least at first, for an American audience. We wanted it to be something that Americans could relate to, that Americans could get inside of. So uh, you know, the, the question of appropriation is always on our minds, always discussed, and, and always complicated. And I guess the last thing I would say about that, too, is that it is my hope that uh, by telling this story and by this show also helping our students to get an education, that our students are going to be able to tell their stories in their way. That is, that is my hope and wish for the future, that if Ugandans want to tell the story of Uganda, that they will be able to do that. Um, I think that we, what's really interesting is as we were developing the show, uh, we did encounter several people along the process that said, too much God, too much God in the show. And Matt and I were like, he's Jewish, I'm Christian, and we believe in something greater than ourselves. So writing a musical about the complexity of helping and not including God in that felt crazy. 
And I don't know if any of you have been to Uganda, but there is God everywhere. The salon is called Jesus and Mary's Salon. <laughs> or in Uganda, as they call it, the saloon. <laughs> so our students are incredibly religious. We pray before every meal in Uganda. And so it felt like we couldn't tell the story of Witness Uganda, which is secretly Witness America. We couldn't tell that story without including religion. Um, and so I, I think you know it felt appropriate to get it inside of the music. It felt appropriate to get it inside of the script. Um, as you know, the anti-gay bill, some of the, the, the bill, I guess, leaders of that bill were Christian ev evangelicals coming from the West. So I feel like we had to throw religion into the mix of it because for me, I wanted to know what am I doing on this planet? And, and I, because I believe in something greater than myself, I had to like reference that inside of the story. I think Matt is the same. I mean, when, you're, when I was standing on a hill in Uganda, six weeks into my journey, trying to think, what am I doing here? I wasn't just asking myself, I was asking God that question. Why am I here? What am I supposed to do on this planet as an artist? What am, who am I? And I think that tackling religion and tackling faith, really. It's about faith. Tackling that inside of the show felt like a no-brainer. We had to do it. And to be honest, it would be irresponsible not to. And additionally, uh, for us, going to the theater is like, it is a religious experience. It's, there's this idea that uh, we go to the theater to escape. And it's a very strange idea, because I think that we spend our whole lives escaping. You walk through Harvard Square, there's homeless people freezing. And we walk by because I've got to go on with my life. We're on the cell phone all day, you know, just escape. You go to the theater because it's the one place where you can actually fully experience your whole life. It is church. It's the church that church, in many cases, isn't able to be anymore. Or maybe never was. I don't know. But, um, but going into that building and getting to share a story that certainly touches me. Uh, as I play it every night, I am still touched every night. Uh, that is a religious, spiritual experience. Speaking about religion, um, a particular bit during the play that I really loved was when you were listening to um, Jacob shares his mm -hmm. <laughs> Walkman with you, and he goes, I, I have a love. And you go, what? Mm -hmm. um, I just thought that was <laughs> <laughs> imagine that it's been both fascinating for you guys and perhaps somewhat excruciating to take this thing that was your project for so long and suddenly have this incredibly talented and prominent creative team around you having to turn it into something with them. Preach. <laughs> and I wonder if you would be willing to share an example of something that was part of your story but somehow didn't fit into the into somebody's creative vision and what that what that either compromise or you know battle or discussion was like. Oh my, I'm going to choose all of my words so carefully because you know, I think that a lot of people will see the show and 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 you know, people don't know that the way that shows get made are a bunch of people in a room throwing ideas onto the floor. That's actually how it's made. No one person does it, not us, not the director, not the choreographer. It is not a moment of, well, that one genius came in and just did it. It's a bunch of people sitting around in a round table discussion going, throw that in. Does that work? That doesn't work? Take it out. What do you think? Throw it in. It don't work? Take it out. That's how it gets done. And even as artists, I think that's surprising too, because you can sort of expect for the adult to come in the room. And there are no adults. We are the adults in the room. <laughs> so we're like, oh, so we should probably make some decisions here. Um, I think that not, not something that really got thrown out, but something that felt important to me inside of this process was telling this story from an African-American perspective. That felt important to me. I think that telling it from, um, you know, a gay black man's perspective was important to me. And that was at the heart of the show because 
for me so long being an actor, I never saw myself on stage or screen. Look around, who is the out gay black actor on television? Name him. I'm curious, there are several white ones. There are several white Broadway stars who make careers out of being out white men. Name the black one. It's real, Billy Porter There's is. There's a Hispanic one, a hawk from a scandal. But he, but he is, he's out in life, right? But I think that what, what I, you're right. And I remember I seeing. Gay bar, so. <laughs> God bless him. He's out, and he is out in life, but I'm, I also meant on screen too. And I think that that is, it's a missing component, not only in, in the entertainment industry, but in our culture. We've, we're not talking about that story and being black and coming from you know, a, a culture where you don't discuss homosexuality in the black culture. You don't discuss it in the black church. It is like taboo. And so it felt really important that, that we try to create a new version of a leading man and not just a leading man, but an every man. I don't think that the show is all about me, but I do think that the show wants to come out of this perspective because even inside of aid work, I've been in Uganda for eight years and I've only encountered one other African-American volunteer and we brought her. <laughs> so no one, so we wanted that to be really, really prominent inside of the storytelling because it's a new voice to the theater. It's a new, we hope it's a new, uh, a chance for an, an other audience to come into the theater. The show is so different when there are black people in the house. We notice as a cast, we're like, oh, there are black people here. We know that because different jokes land, mm -hmm. things land differently. Um, they're catching different nuances, especially young black people. When they come to the theater, they're usually not seeing themselves in the music man and the sound of music. And we're not seeing our lives up there, so we're translating the sound of music to make it fit us. But we're rarely seeing stories that are about us with complex characters that are imperfect and that aren't wearing dresses, that, that aren't, aren't cartoons, wearing, and just, that aren't jungle animals. It's really, really, it felt really important for us to get that out. And I think also to wrap the creative team around, no, this is the vision. It has to go like this. Because my hope is that other kids like me when I was 17 or even adults will come to the theater and see me and think, that's my story in front of me. I don't have to translate it. That's my story. And I hope that it spans the color lines and gender lines and race and culture. Hi, I'm Tammy Drummond. I'm with the Open Tribune. Hi. And um, I'm just curious, what made you decide not to show Pastor Jan? I mean, that was obviously an artistic decision. And I'm wondering, is this someone who's still with us? Have we heard anything about from him since the play came out? There's, uh, th again, people that he's, that, that he's based on. But I, it was a very conscious decision. Uh, because I think that we didn't want something that could tangibly just be destroyed, that could go away. Again, it's, it, 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 it's something that we talk a lot about, that there's this enemy. You can place all of the uh, fear, hate, and trouble onto Joseph Coney or onto Osama. Osama bin Laden. And if we can just get that one guy, then it's all going to be OK. And we, going along with the theme of that life is complicated. We didn't want it to be that simple. We just didn't want it to be that simple. We wanted it to feel like something that was more elusive, less tangible, something that you couldn't see, hold, contain. It, it, it was always going to be there. And so that was it. That was really the reason why we felt like he can never show up. He must always be a presence, as he will always be a presence, but he can never show up. I'm um, Hussett Sharp from the BBC News in London. Um, you mentioned Coney just now. There was the really successful and pretty controversial Invisible Children campaign a couple of years ago. And also recently, the Book of Mormon, which is a <coughs> slightly different take on American sort of charity work in Uganda. Is your work, is there any sort of reference to any of those things in your work? And is there any sort of response? Have, have you sort of responded to either of those in, in, in your production? I think that people always ask us to respond to Book of Mormon and Invisible Children. And I think that Matt and I set out to let the work be the response. Um, because both of those things are super complicated. Um, 
and we know both of those people. We know Invisible Children, and we know Book of Mormon creators, and 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 so it is complicated. So we wanted Witness Uganda to to speak for itself. We wanted to create complex characters. We wanted to not try to to make it about one bad guy. So we tried to put all of our thoughts about Invisible Children and Coney and Book of Mormon and the anti-gay bill and all of those things and the church, all of it. We tried to get it all into the work so that the work could speak so that we didn't have to feel like we had to take a stance about that thing. And, and I think that you know, we're hoping that the audience, you know, the good thing about both Book of Mormon and Coney was that it put Uganda right on the front. So for us, as creators of a show called Witness Uganda, uh, which for a long time inside of the development was change the title. No one's going to want to see a show called Witness Uganda. I cannot tell you how many people have come to that theater and said, how did you get here? Why did you come? And they're like, oh, I saw a bus go by that said Witness Uganda. And I was like, what's going on in Uganda? <laughs> and we're like, oh my god. <laughs> so we tried to stick through to the things that felt important to us and just let the work speak to all of those, those issues. I see. Yes, I do. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, yes, and also, and uh, given the church's history with gayness, and uh, I'm like, why are you still a Christian? Yeah. You know, I think that also inside of the, the story, you know, my mom, my dad's an elder at the church, and my parents were really concerned about the story before they got a chance to see it. And, and I, I think that our show tries to tackle the idea that, you know, like in Uganda, there's the anti-gay bill, but not all Ugandans hate gay people. That is politics. Politics are here, and people are here. We know that in this country. We know that all of the politics going on in DC are not the way that we all feel about everything. That's politics. It's the same thing in the church. Not all Christians hate gay people. And I think Griffin goes on a journey to say, I'm never going back to that church. I'll never deal with those Christians. But what he comes to find out is that it was one person in the congregation who made a decision, not the entire congregation. And I think that my parents, you know, when they, they came to see the show, my mom was really moved by that because I think she was concerned that I was going to come out with like an anti-church, anti-Christian campaign. That's not at all what the point is. It's that in every religion, there are, you know, there's differences in Judaism, like there's differences in Christianity. There are people that feel this way and there are people that feel this way and people are just people. It doesn't mean that you have to give up your entire religion. You just have to find the people inside of your religion that feel like you're connected to. And that was my journey. In Uganda. Well, there's a huge difference. <laughs> I don't, there's a huge difference, and strangely enough, there's a huge difference, and strangely enough, there's um, no difference. Um, I think one of the things that I learned as I was trying to find myself is that in this culture, we define people. Um, and I spent years being defined as gay. I spent years being defined as black. And when I got to Uganda, they called me Mzungu, which means white person. <laughs> it was the first time that I stepped foot into a country and a culture where I was the same as him, where I wasn't black. And you know, black in this country comes with a whole history of oppression. So black people are walking around this country feeling oppressed, whether you like to think it or not. We are. So when I got to Uganda and they didn't see me as black, they just saw me as American. I, it was the first time I felt American. I was like, oh my god, I'm American. I'm not African American, I'm American. And that was really freeing for me to not feel like I had to walk around with all of my oppression. And I didn't have to walk around with that. They were like, you're American like he's American. So that was freeing. And I also, you know, I was sitting on the hill with the students 
early in the journey and realized that my sexuality was such a small part of my life. Once I had met them and I was living my life with them and sharing our lives and our stories and the similarities and the differences, I was like, my sexuality does not define me. And that too was freeing, to realize that I wasn't just a gay man. I was a man. And I was in the world like they were in the world and we were just doing it together. And that was freeing. And I've always said, I, when, I say, when I get a chance to speak to African American communities about this show, I always encourage African Americans to travel, especially young ones, because you will grow up in this country feeling like there is a, there's a ceiling. And I'm like, if you bust out of this country, you will find that the ceiling is this. And I think that we grow up knowing that there's a ceiling here. And once you leave, you find that the world is at your fingertips. And that was my experience. And I encourage people to get out of this country so you can find your power and, and your place in the world. Holly? I said this as you guys were walking in. I very much appreciated the show. Um, I'm married to the four correspondent from who spent time in Africa. And, uh, and it really resonated in large part because that mirrored a lot of what we saw. Uh, I'm also, I work in human rights. And when you were speaking, I was thinking of the Canadian intern who said, well, in Canada, we you know, trying to get away from that. But um, and I also really appreciated the honesty and the willingness to put yourself out there. But I think what I appreciate most is that you could have walked away cynical and bitter. And you could have walked away from the whole thing and gave up because it was really hard and you didn't. And, you know, I think in that way, maybe the naivete that was in some degree wiped away is also incredibly helpful. And it's wonderful that you did it. Um, and I just have two really easy questions. One, were the actors, uh, especially the students, African, of African origin, because the accents were so wonderful. And then the second one is, what happened to your best friend? <laughs> the, uh, the African, the students, none of the student, the kids who, the actors who play students are African. Uh, two of the actors in the show are, are African. The, the woman who plays Joy is from Nigeria, and the, uh, young man who plays Jacob, his parents are, are from Nigeria. But Adiola was also, she was born in Nigeria, but she was raised in America. She was born in Nigeria, right. She was raised here. Um, that was an easy question, thank you. <laughs> uh, the second part of the question was, has completely escaped me. What happened to my best friend? Oh, what happened to your best friend? Um, the, the Ryan character is based off of several, several different women, so I couldn't quite say, well, she went here and she did this, but. People always want to know, is she successful? Yes, she's successful. Are you still friends? Yes, we're all still friends. Has she seen it? All of the women have come to see the show. And they, at least to our faces, have told us that they loved it. Hi. The night I came to see the show, uh, you had an amazing guest with you guys. You had Long Jones with you. And um, so uh, Long Jones, for those who were not there on that night, is um, LGBT activist, the most prominent one, I think, of Uganda, who's right now a refugee in Boston. And he seemed to make pretty clear that uh, once the law passes, anybody who's linked to anything that has to do with LGBT will be taken down too. So I was wondering, what was, what's your, like your floor plan for your kids when mm -hmm. it comes to that? And um, or do you think they'll be saved by the fact that you are Muslim Goose and maybe you don't um, the laws won't apply the same way to your organization than they will to others. And to what extent, you talked earlier that at the beginning, um, the LGBT uh, material wasn't in the piece and you added it. And I was just wondering if you can walk us through the process of deciding to do that, because obviously it's going to have a pretty big consequence. Um, it's, I think, part of the reason that we, we've chosen not to go back in the near future is, is for that. You know, we don't have a a footprint on the ground in Uganda. It's not like we don't have an office. We don't have staff there. It's, uh, it really is a, about our connection with them. So we are connected to them through the internet, through the phone. We talk to, at least one of us talks to at least one of them daily. But, uh, and they know that we're gay. And they know that we're gay. Yeah. Uh, so you know we've sort of been keeping in contact with members of the LGBTI community on the ground there, and also our students to just be kept abreast of what's going on, do you feel safe, what's happening. Uh, and for now, 
there, there's not a really concrete link between us other than <coughs> they get money from West, they pick up money from Western Union. Okay. The state doesn't know. The state doesn't know. We don't have any affiliation with the country of Uganda other than that we visit there or visited there once a year and spent time there. But there's no official anything as far as Uganda is concerned. Office or anything like that. Um, again, looking towards the future, uh, safety is our, is our number one concern. Uh, and something that sort of my lesson from, from the Peace Corps, from living in West Africa, was always that you know, there's, there's different ways to sort of build walls. You can either literally build walls and, and put up you know, barbed wire and glass on the top of the wall to keep people out. Or you build up a community, and you rely on that community to, to, to tell you what's happening. And that's the way that we, we do it. We can't, we can't build fences around all of our students. But what, we've, what we continue to do is to stay in contact with them and the people who live around them, and people even in Long Jones's uh, community, to know like what's happening there. What is happening on the ground? Uh, why did we ultimately choose to? talk about homosexuality in the piece because it was our responsibility. I think we, we struggled with it for a long time. Should we talk about this? Should we not talk about it? And as, as theater artists and as humanitarians and as activists, which to me those three things are all interwoven, uh, it was irresponsible to tell this story without telling it as honestly as we could. Um, so yeah. And I also think that we wanted, like I said before, I think we wanted to create a new everyman. And I don't actually think that the story is about being gay or coming out. It's actually just a story that I just so happen to be that way. Um, and that, and again, like I don't know that we have many stories in our, you know, in our libraries about people that just so happen to be, as opposed to, you know, this is a gay story. I think it's a story that deals with sexuality. And so to create a show where me not dealing with sexuality felt crazy. It felt like broken antenna. And so we were like, we should probably talk about that. Rachel. Um, I'm curious, um, was this the first musical collaboration you've worked on together? And what was the experience like working on something that you're, that you're partnered with? And do you want to do it again <laughs> for other productions? <laughs> Yeah, this is a, I guess this is the first full-fledged thing. It doesn't feel like the first thing because we've been working on it for so long, so it feels like we've written 10 things together. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was the first, and it was hard for years in the same way that a relationship is hard, yeah. I'm sure, at different points for years. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of our working relationship, it's, it has been amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no one on this planet that I trust more with my work and my life than this man. Uh, and that is a a great gift to to meet someone that for me that you know you want to share your life and your work with it's complicated mm -hmm. but it's it, we're a family business but uh but it's it's wonderful and will we write more together speaking of family business speaking of family business we actually just got asked to write a piece uh for a theater in la in center theater group uh, a piece about the changing face of the american family and sort of, we're writing it kind of similarly to how we did this. We're interviewing members of our respective families to talk about how have we gone from, you know, a, a country, uh, you know, where his ancestors and family are black, Christian uh, people, and my relatives are white Jews. How did, how did those two groups of people come together to form this bond of a black, gay, Christian, and a white, gay Jew who want to adopt children from, you know, downtown LA. Downtown LA. Like, <laughs> how did that happen? And how has that become, like, the, the new, th that's a family. That's now America. Uh, exactly. Modern family. We would use that title, except somebody bought it. Somebody took it. <laughs> Modern family, the musical. The musical. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, this question is for you. I also started a nonprofit, and people ask me all the time. They say, well, you know, we see all these problems that are going on in the world, and we really want to address them. And they say to me, what was it that uh, really struck a chord with you? What made you make the step to make this official, to 
you know, devote all your energy and efforts towards doing this. So I'm going to ask you the question, what was it that caused you to first take the trip to Uganda and then take that next step of breaking away from the original um, group that you were working with and developing your own nonprofit? I think I've always had an itch to know people and to know the world. And so my parents had never left the country. Um, I think I'm the first person in my family, immediate family for sure, and even extended family that, that has gone back to Africa. Um, and as an artist, I think artists are dreamers and curious, and, and that's just who I am. So when the, the, the opportunity came for me to go to Uganda, I was like, let's go. Um, and I think that inside of why I broke away from that organization is because when I got to Uganda, I discovered that the organization was uh, corrupt. It was a Ugandan-run organization. The, the pastor who was running it was embezzling money, and I decided to break away. But why did I decide to make our organization official? <laughs> For many different reasons. Uh, logistically speaking, we needed to raise a certain amount of money, and Americans won't give you that money unless it's tax deductible. That's a true story. So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is it felt um, really quickly, it felt bigger than me. And so it became a responsibility and a duty to take it on, not just, like I said, I felt like Uganda chose me and, and those kids chose me. I don't know that I chose them. And I walked down the road and said, you, 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 come with me. It didn't work like that. They said, you, come with me. And so, you know, over the years, it has just felt like my responsibility, like any parent has a responsibility to the child that they have, whether they birthed that child or adopted that child, you have a responsibility to them. And so for me, running the organization feels like the baby and our responsibility to it. And, um, and I hope that, you know, that the organization ends up inspiring other people to want to run their own organizations and not feel like the organization has to be a multi-million dollar organization. That is some people's calling. That wasn't mine. And I knew it instantly because my friends are invisible children. And they were running a multi-million dollar nonprofit and I was watching what their lives were and I was like, oh my god, that can't be my life. That can't be my life. But I'm glad it's their lives, but it couldn't be mine. And so I, I knew that I wanted to have the same experience of being able to raise money for education without having to make it, you know, this huge scaled organization. And I think that I've heard from other people that run smaller grassroots nonprofits who are like, thank you. Thank you for not, you know, taking this opportunity to scale a Uganda project, but thank you for just like sticking true to the thing that you feel you're supposed to do. And I think, like I said, if, you, if your thing is a multi-million dollar nonprofit, thank you. Thank you for doing it, because those are needed too. But if that's not your thing, like, do your thing. Do it well. The word is that um, Witness Uganda is the next big Broadway hit. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to share with us in that regard? Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sure. Everyone thinks we have all this information. That's what's so funny about that question. They're all like, <laughs> yes, we, we don't have any information. We have no information on that. <laughs> I wish, I, look, we, we are hopeful that this, this piece will reach as many people as it can reach. Uh, <laughs> the business of making theater is a whole other, that's a whole other musical. Uh, so right now, it's wait. We, will, we will wait and see. There will be no big announcements happening on closing night on Sunday. I can pretty much guarantee that. And if they happen, we'll be shocked. If they happen, we'll be we'll shocked. We'll be crying like babies. Yeah. But, uh, but I think we want the show to go as far as it can go and to reach as many people as it can reach. That was always really the original. As we developed it, we knew that we wanted to get it in front of as many people as we could from all over the world. I didn't realize that you guys were all from different places. So it's exciting to hear all of the accents and the questions. And the, I'm like, oh, yes, like this was what we wanted. Because I, because I think that the show, the themes inside of the show can touch anybody. We've had panelists from all over the world. We've had students from the African Le uh, Leadership Academy come, which was an amazing act three. Because it's, like, it's so interesting to us as creators to hear how the show affects a girl from Senegal. So. That's exciting to me, and so the idea of how the show affects 
someone from the UK or someone from South Africa or whatever, I think that's super exciting. So wherever it can go, we're just, we're going to follow it. Not yet. Not yet. How does it work? I mean, just out of curiosity, how would it work? Like, for you guys, what would need to happen for you guys to go to Broadway? Like, what's the next step? There would be uh, commercial producers who would become involved. Uh, theoretically, Diane Paulus's schedule would have to open up to <laughs> at the at the same time <laughs> as, as I, I she's a she is one of the busiest directors on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, she does have several projects going on, but her schedule would have to open up at the same time that the commercial producers could raise the probably close to $8 million that it would take to do the show, at the same time that a theater that could house a musical and that was not too big and not too small, but just the right size for this show, would open up on Broadway. It's a healthy dose of luck, to be completely yeah, honest, because all of those things combined are like, Yeah. Yes. That happens? Sure. Sure. So I mean, have, I think, are, do you rock right? Work? I mean, are you? <laughs> you know, somebody, just, somebody. I'm, a, I'm a TV producer, so I can maybe get you like a hit on like a talk we're, show. We're not. We're, yeah. we're, we're not opposed. We're not opposed to an HBO special. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we're not opposed. We are not opposed. <laughs> okay, can I ask another question? Sure. eight shows a week, and then coming out and talking about it. And for years before that, you were talking about your show. Here you are talking about your show, and you guys are so fascinating. But what's it like? I guess it's interesting for me, the journalist, is what is it like to have to constantly talk about this? Are there moments where you're just like, oh, God, I said the exact same thing last night? Or like, do you, what is it like to have to talk about something over and over? <laughs> it's why I think that as creators, and artists, you have to create the thing that you love. I don't know, honest to God, I had never written a musical before. This is the first musical I've ever written. And, you know, we've had other offers to, would you write this movie musical idea? Da, 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 da. And I'm like, I don't know how you could write a show because we've been through so much, you know, joy and pain and heartbreak throughout the five years of trying to get the show done. I don't know how you could write a show that you are not like my my insides need to tell that story every night. Every night, and then to talk about it every day. Every day. So, yeah. thankfully, the art and the passion are combined so that it feels like every time we get a chance to talk about the show to a room full of people like you, it is not only do your questions inspire us, but we feel energized by it. And we feel like we have to keep digging. Yeah. Because I think that's also what it's about. You know, th for us, the show feels like a living, breathing thing every night. And, it's, it, and the conversations feel like a living, breathing thing. Like, what, what else is there to see? What else is there to get at? Yeah. So it, I think, like Griffin said, like we wrote about something that we had to write about or we were going <laughs> to die. Literally, we would die. We will, this will kill us if we don't tell this story right now. And so. How does it? How is it? It's freaking awesome. awesome. It's awesome and hard and sometimes emotional and sad and scary. I mean, we're in a room full of journal. Like, what the heck? You're gonna ask me a, the question that's gonna like take me down. Like, what is it gonna be? <laughs> what is it gonna be? We are nice journalists. No, you are so nice. You're so nice. He said the BBC. I, was I like, know. Oh I was my like, god. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mostly afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! But it's true. I, yeah, it's all of those things. Is this is this passion that, that you've had for the show for the past five years? Is it transferable to the next project to the the postmodern family? Project? Yeah, yeah. Because I think you know we had the same thing. We were in a writers group at Center Theater Group, and we had to come up with something to write. And we were in Germany. My my grandfather served in World War II right after the war ended. And for his 80th birthday, he wanted to go back to the town where he was stationed, which was crazy because my grandfather, like, never, that, leave. He no, he don't, never leaves he don't go nowhere. from Pittsburgh. He's, like, up in his house living. And so when he said he wanted to go back to Germany, at first, I didn't even know that he was in Germany. I was like, what are you talking about? Germany? You went to Germany? Like, I didn't know that. And so me and Matt and my mom took him back to Germany for his 80th birthday. And 
we visited the barracks where he was and in this small town called Schwäbisch Gmund. <laughs> and, um, and then he started telling me stories about, he got to his dormitory, it's just, it's now an apartment building, but he was like, that was the room where I write, wrote to your grandmother every night, because my mother was born while he was in Germany. He was like, that was the room, and this was the field, and I mean, it was like watching an old man start to go, there it was, and there, and this, and this, and this, and this. And then we decided that we wanted to go visit um, a concentration camp in Dachau. Uh, Dachau was a concentration camp, and um, we were kind of hesitant, because I don't know, like in your family, it was not something that was, I mean, none of your parents, have, your parents, your relatives haven't been. No, and, and quite to be perfectly honest with you, as, as a Jew, I was like, get it, World War II, never forget, you know, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. All right, all right, all right, let's go to the concentration camp, we're in Germany. And we went to the concentration camp, and it was the first time in my life that I knew ghosts were real. Because I was standing on this ground uh, in this place with my black boyfriend and his black mother and grandfather. And I was like, 60 years ago, we all would have died here. And now we're, I can stand here and like hold your hand and visit the place where your grandfather served. It was just like there were just ghosts everywhere in this country that I've never even been to. And yet I felt so connected. And like we just we knew, we were like that's that's the story. that's the moment when you when you are connecting with that I feel like I have to use like a bad word but when you're connecting with that shit when it's like that deep in you and it and like it's coming up through the earth it's like that song ah, la, 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 that thing that's when you know like that's the thing you're supposed to do that's the thing you're supposed to write about so. And then as we started uncovering that, you know, we started talking about like, I didn't even know my grandfather served in the war. And then we found out that his grandmother was an air raid warden in New York City. So we felt like we got these pictures of his grandmother holding a helmet. We were like, why is this old lady hold, holding a helmet? And then, so then, and his sister is in the military and she married an, a military. And then they just adopted a baby from Ethiopia. And we were like, wait. All the layers, because we always thought, like, what is Becca doing in the military? Why, why did she choose? Me? And then we saw the picture of Becca's grandmother, and we were like, great grandmother. It just, or great grandmother. It skipped a generation, two generations. And we were like, aha, here it is. Here comes a story. There's a lineage. There's something. And we, we, don't, uh, we don't have history in this country like that. Mm -hmm. just don't, I mean, we don't have, I, 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 everybody's from somewhere else. Like, our name was changed when they, they came when they crossed the Atlantic. My grandfather changed his name when he moved to the north from Cawthorn, from Cawthorn to Cawthorn, because everyone kept saying in Cawthorn, they dropped the R in the name and made it an O-N. And then his family changed their name from and Goldberg. And the song goes like this. Yeah, sorry. But, but you get it. Like, you're getting that. crazy right now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> ART 2018, The Family Show. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Friedhoff. I uh, work in programming here at the Neiman Foundation. I've also been working on global health a lot um, over the years. So the transition is a little difficult because I am German, and that's not a part of the history that we're very <laughs> proud of. <But> it almost <laughs> makes me cry to hear what you have to say about the moment you stood there. Mm. Um, on the global health front, I was so excited when I saw, when I heard about Witness Uganda, when I saw. Um, what you were doing because Harvard is full of young people who want to do global health or want to do something with it. Mm -hmm. It's full of a lot of academics who do a lot. Um, the world is full of thousands of NGOs who are not collaborating very well. There's a lot of shit going on in that field. And I thought, wow, what an amazing idea to create an artistic view and to sort of articulate and discuss everything that goes on in all these individuals right, that converge at Harvard but never actually talk about these things. So I'm wondering, what kind of responses have you gotten from students? Have you heard from professors who would say like, but you make it very complicated, really. I mean, that's not how we talk about it. What's, what's the Harvard response been to this? I think it's been, uh, it's been mostly really supportive and excited, but definitely like, uh, definitely some mixed ideas. We were on the panel with somebody last night who, uh, <laughs> Do we get lit? Oh my God, it's being recorded. She's gonna watch this. I'm kidding. It's fine. Uh, but I mean, we were on the panel with someone last night who was, you know, speaking about the fact that 
you know, if you're a small grassroots nonprofit and you don't have boots on the ground, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. <laughs> and we're sitting there, and Griffin was like, well, it works it for works us. It works for us. <laughs> but I felt like I had to say that yeah. because I think that, look, I, we, Matt and I want people, we want our show to be a conversation starter. And someone is welcome to come to the show and hate it, and people have. But I also feel like we have to be able to defend the work. And we created something that we believe in. We created an organization that we believe in. And I understand the, the degrees and the people study this thing for a living. I know that. I get that. But I also can't deny my experience because just because you've studied it. I'm living it, and you've studied it, and I'm sure you've lived it too. But just because I've lived one experience does not mean that your experience that you've lived is the same. So I felt like I had to defend it and say, well, it works for us. <laughs> I gotta say it. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's, so we've had people who have challenged us. And honestly, we've had people who have challenged us in a great way, too. Sue Cook was like, you know, we gave this answer about, she asked about the anti-gay, somebody asked about the anti-gay bill. And we said, you know, you have, we have to sign the petitions, and we have to write to our, our politicians, and we have to encourage people to, you know, not be silent. And Sue Cook said, thanks, boys. Um, but I think you might need to take it to the streets. Because <laughs> evil is real. So when are we going to take it to the streets? And we were like, yes. <laughs> So we'll take, I mean, I think we've taken both the, the, the criticisms as good things and tough things. But, you know, we've been inspired talking to Harvard people. And, um, and I'm always curious when people, you know, have questions about the show or didn't like a section of the show or didn't understand a section because either it tells us that we can write that section better or it tells us that it might not be for everybody. And I also want to say this too, just about the, the first half of your, your statement. You know what was so interesting about being in Germany? You, 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 you're stealing my thunder, but go ahead, do it. Oh, no, say it. Because you were thinking the same, same thing. Same thing, go ahead. You know what's so interesting about being in Germany as an American? It was the first time that I was like, I love Germany, and I would live here. Yep. Because, the th because I didn't realize until we stepped, we stepped into that airport, and I will never forget it, because I had never been to Germany. I stepped in that airport and heard those German accents, and fear went through me. And I was like, oh my god, I had no idea that I felt this way. Because the only portrayal of Germans that I've ever had in my life were Nazis. And then, we, it's true. It's, I mean, I hate to be, sound so ignorant, but it's really true. And I want to be honest about that. And so in spending two weeks in Germany, I developed a great love and respect for Germans. My great grandmother is German, which a white woman, German. And I, and I felt like you know, we had some really intense conversations with Germans about their history and about wanting to move on from their history and about wanting to create a new narrative about what Germany is in the world. And we left that trip going, we should get a house in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but I felt like I needed to say that because I, because I, it was one of the, the talking points of learning where stereotypes come from. And you don't even know you're living a stereotype until you're face to face with it. And then you're like, I got it all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I got it all wrong. So that. Well, if you have a place for us to stay, we're coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's do it. Great. Let's do it. Yes, and uh, uh, my husband is just about the same. <coughs> excuse me, Ellie, uh, uh, and a sort of uh, uh, my big time show here, of course, is um, American Idol. <laughs> Thoughts about that uh, in terms of. About American Idol? Yeah. Same quality, et cetera, like the whole process of making. Oh, oh my goodness. that's interesting. I don't know. I mean, it's funny because American Idol started while I was in the Peace Corps. I came back from the Peace Corps and people were like, Kelly Clarkson. And I was like, who? <laughs> uh, I, I would be lying if I didn't say that like, I don't guiltily watch The Voice and, and, um, and American Idol every so often. It's, it's fun. But look, I, I think what it comes down to for me is just that I think that artists have a responsibility. I just do. And I, I can totally appreciate a great voice and great singing. And I think it's awesome that there are people, the, indus, the, in, the industry is 
really hard to get noticed in. And there are many, 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 many great artists that we know who are so freaking talented who just don't get a platform. And that's a place where they can sort of get seen. But I also think that, again, in, in our culture, there's just this oversimplification of like artist as entertainer. And I, it dri it, that drives me a little bit, cra bit crazy. Because we are, uh, we're, we're, we're simplifying and shrinking what we do. You know, I, I believe that artists are doctors. Artists are priests. Artists are lawyers and teachers and brain surgeons. And I think that it's important that like we realize that responsibility, or else it, it just becomes about the same surfacey crap that we're forgive me, that, that, that a lot of us, that I, am doing in a lot of my life. And I need the reminder in my life to go deeper. I need the reminder to take a breath, to, to remember that people are people, that a German is a human being when I walk off that plane, that it's not just this movie version that I've had in my head. And I think that that's what art lets us do. It opens up the cracks and lets you see inside. It lets you see something deeper. So. Like all things, uh, those reality TV, those TV shows, they're complicated. And they create wonderful opportunities. And they shrink culture. And so that's it. Time will tell. Time will tell. Um, I w I, just to make one comment to Matt, I'm not sure you think of yourself as a performer in the show, but. I do. You are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I did find myself as captivating um, and as magnetic as you and the other actors are. Um, I found myself, I couldn't see you quite uh, where you were, but I could see you um, on the monitor. On the monitor. And I watched you through a lot of it. And I, there may be a different level of engagement there because you, you're a co-creator of it. Um, but to me, you were every bit um, as much of a, a performer in the, in the show um, as Griff and the others were. Thank my you. question is about um, is about how you've experienced journalism, both in um, reading about uh, Uganda, um, either while you were there or in the years since you've been going back, but also in these months um, through interviews and reviews and and, and people and, telling the story wrong. <laughs> It's what, what's, I, the, the reason why I'm laughing at that question is because I'm in a room full of journalists and we've been talking about that. Um, we have a very um, famous friend in the theater who uh, does not speak to the press. And for the longest time, I thought he was crazy. Why don't you speak to the press? You're crazy. And he was like, I don't like the press. And over the past couple of weeks of doing interviews, I can tell you that it's been really tricky because you will spend an hour on the phone with someone or face to face with someone and the article will get published and you're misquoted and wrong quotes, wrong names, wrong spellings, wrong organizations, wrong website. It's just, it's, I would, I, I mean, and I feel like the responsibility to say it to you guys because you are journalists, but I would almost say 90, 5% of the articles written about us, there's, a, there's an incorrect something in it. And then we had dinner with our famous friend. And I said, I understand why you don't talk to the press. Because it can be really hard to read in print something you didn't say or something that is wrong information. I mean, our director won a Tony. And in some of the reviews, her name is Diana Paulus. Her name is Diane Paulus. That's like calling him Steffen Spielberg. <laughs> I mean, really, it's like when the, so it's like, so I'm gonna really, how much weight can I give this review or this article when like the Tony Award winning Diane Paulus's name is spelled wrong? I don't know what to say. It's, so it's been really like tricky because we've had really great relationships with the press and we've had great lunches and dinners and coffees and phone chats. But I will say that it's been kind of surprising because I've never had to do so much of it to find that there's so many misquotes and misprints. And it made me start to wonder about 
other things that I read. I'm serious. I never, I never thought about it because most of us are not getting the opportunity to talk to the press. So you're just reading things all the time and going, oh, that's true and that's true. Oh my God, well, she said and da 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 da. I don't know if you guys saw that Alec Baldwin thing that went around Facebook, his article about you know, being misquoted by the press and da da da. And you see these celebrities who say, I'm going and hiding, no more press. I sort of like, I start to understand. I mean, we're like newbies and we're thankfully, you know, have had really great experiences with the press. But I can only imagine if you have a bad one, how that can really. I don't know, harm your career or harm your, you know, I don't know, your heart. That's honest. The is press that... has been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, that's true. That's true. I think it's, I think we have a, 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 a large learning curve ahead of us yeah. in terms of the press and, uh, and in terms of the way that Uganda's represented or that Africa in general is represented. Uh, I, I think I actually have a lot of uh, a lot of love because because I think people are trying to do the best they can. I think that I, I, that doesn't mean they're doing the best, but I think they're trying to do the best they can. And and I and that's not really based on any specific experience. Like the press misquoted me or said something wrong about Africa, but like we're flawed. We're here. It goes back to your question about like how did you come up with the music and African music and like. You're American or you're French and you're British and you're trying to tell a story about a place that you like only understand through the eyes of an American, a Brit, or a Frenchman or wherever you're from. And like that's the story that you tell. And 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 we're trying to do the I think people are trying to do the best they can. Can I ask a question back to you? Just for the whole room. Is it surprising when I say that to you, or are you guys not yeah. surprised? Okay, amazing. I just wanted to make sure it was that was that shocking for you? The whole room went, no, it's not shocking. But I but there's like a lot of really bad journalists the way there's a lot of really bad journalists. But none of them are in this room. There's a lot of really bad journalists too. Right. Like a lot of people are really bad at everything. Right. You shouldn't judge everyone by like low common and Yeah. But you know what else is interesting inside of the press? Is that a lot there's like bloggers. Which is, I don't know, it's new for the theater. We had a conversation with um, some of the, the press team of ART, and like a lot of the reviewers now are bloggers, which is interesting. It's great because it's, you know, you know, social media, but it's not necessarily like we're talking to the BBC. Like, you know, we we would love to talk to the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of bloggers, young bloggers, older bloggers. I mean, it's just so it's like every, the same way that I'm sure um, TV actors, we feel like reality TV kind of destroyed television, scripted television, because everyone then could be a celebrity and a star. You could be on a reality TV show and be a star for doing nothing. That's like scary for actors who need scripted dramas, right? But I'm sure it's sort of similar in the press because everyone's now, a, everyone's a blogger. Everyone has their, their Twitter follower. Everyone, and their Twitter follower could actually you know, be more followed than an article in a legit, you know, press publication. publication. So I don't know, it's like this weird thing where social media starts to, you know, inf maybe infringe and maybe, I don't know, push the boundaries of and press. Do you have a social media presence at all? Because I haven't been able to find it. Witness Uganda does. No. And neither of you and do. And neither of, but, and we have our Facebook pages. But we've chosen, again, very <laughs> specifically, not to have the Matt and Griffin fan page. Because it's about the show, it's it, it is about the show, and certainly we are a part of the show. Uh, but Greg, our Greg, who is our we call him our chief of staff, mm -hmm. but uh, he's encouraged us to start. I I don't know. It's a lot of it's it's well, just like unusual too much. as an actor, right? Because I think most actors do a lot of self promotion. Yeah, so they're not. You want that to be part of your job. <laughs> Seems like you know. You know what? I, I always think this again, brutally honest about that. In my several years inside of this industry, I find that people care when they care. And I think a lot of actors spend a lot of time trying to get everyone to care. They spend a lot of money on publicists and a lot of, I just sort of think that people will care when they care. And for me, if they care, if they care, and if that comes to a point when people start to really care, maybe we'll talk about we'll talk with, with Greg. But, but I also think that. I'm cautious of doing that because I want, I want people to know the work first. 
surprisingly, I'm standing up on stage every night telling my story, but I do want people to know the work and associate me with the work. Well, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> thank you.